are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God and you are gods. You're not just human. And our good God said, oh yeah, they're my children. Of course they're equal to me. than now. I just love Jesus 24-7. Thank you. There's something about it. Just I grin every time I hear it. Like, good for you. I, I'm not sure I do, but good for you. Not that I don't love God, but you know, to be that you know, chipper and cheery about 24-7, I think we all have our bad moments. But uh, anyways, uh, we're starting our um, message series this morning, Hey Jude, and we're going to be taking a look over the next several weeks uh, about and over the book of Jude. And when I say the book of Jude, I, I'm being a little generous because it's not necessarily, I mean, it's a book, uh, it's a letter, uh, but it's really a chapter. Um, and so uh, what's interesting is though Jude is only one chapter long, uh, it's not the shortest book in the Bible. It's the fifth shortest book in the Bible. Uh, so there's four other books that are shorter than Jude, even though it's just uh, one chapter. But because it's so short, you probably haven't heard a lot of sermons on the book of Jude. Um, you probably haven't been to a Bible study on the book of Jude. So probably a lot of us in here are not real familiar with it. But as I went through the book of Jude, as I was trying to figure out a book of the Bible to preach on, um, I, I was really amazed that though it's just some 27 verses or whatever it is long, um, right around that, um, there's a lot of good stuff in it. So I'm gonna be completely honest. The plan is that I am gonna be giving eight sermons over the chapter of Jude. And if you know the way that my brain works, that is like an insurmountable task uh, because I'm a big picture kind of person. I'm not a detailed person. But literally, as I read through it, I, I was like, wow, this is good, this is good. And three or four different times, because I planned this like uh, several months ago, I, I went back and reread it like, am I sure I can preach a sermon on that? So uh, we'll see. It's supposed to be eight, might end up being three. But nonetheless... We'll see how it goes. Uh, I think this first week goes uh, pretty well. Um, so first of all, we want to talk about who is this Jude and why did he write his letter? And the interesting thing is, is we don't have the answer to who is this Jude. Um, there's not consensus on it. We don't know for sure. Uh, there's two very good uh, guesses on who this Jude is. Uh, the first guess is that this is Judas the Apostle, not, um, not Judas Iscariot, but Judas known as Thaddeus, or, and this is a more likely uh, answer, is that this is Judas, the brother of James, who's the brother of Jesus. So this is Jude, the brother of Jesus. Now this name Jude or Judas uh, is a very common name in the Greek. It's the Greek name for the, the Hebrew word Judah. So it's a very common name, and, and we're not 100% sure who actually wrote the book. But he's writing it to the early Christian church. This has taken place maybe about uh, 20 years or so after the time of Jesus. And uh, initially, he's writing just for encouragement to the church, but uh, false teaching has crept into the church that he changes the reason why he writes his letter. So let's start there in uh, Jude verse 3. Uh, and he says, dear friends, although I was very eager to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and to urge you to contend for the faith that was once and for all entrusted to God's holy people. So his original plan was is to write about salvation that we share to celebrate who Jesus is and so forth. But then he feels compelled to actually change that and to write them to contend in the faith, to persevere in the faith and, uh, and, and, and to really deal with some false teaching that has made its way into the church. And so where I really want to spend my time this morning preaching is on Jude chapter 4. So uh, let's take a look at Jude chapter 4. For certain individuals whose condemnation was written about long ago have secretly slipped in amongst you. Uh, they are ungodly people and they pervert the grace of our God into a license for immorality 
and that they actually deny Jesus Christ our sovereign and Lord. So he was going to talk to them about uh, just Jesus and, and, and celebrating the salvation we have, but he's having to deal with, with, with this error. And, and notice what he says. He calls these people ungodly people. He says their condemnation was written about long ago. So the, these people who have brought in these false teachings are condemned people. They're ungodly people. And you know what's crazy is what he's complaining about is common in the church today. But the problem is, is like, for us, we just accept it. It's like to each his own. But for Jude, it's like, no, these people, like their condemnation was written about long ago. That they're ungodly people. And what does he talk about? He talks about two different kinds of people. Uh, first is he talks about uh, those who deny, he says, uh, the sovereign and Lord. Uh, and when he's talking about Jesus Christ, he says our only sovereign and Lord, uh, that word sovereign really means all powerful. So it, it's people who deny ultimately Jesus is God. And so we see that not only amongst the Mormons who see Jesus as a son of God, like God's got many sons. We also see it in the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, but we also see it in, in, in the mainstream Christian church as well. And I'm gonna talk about that Next, But what I want to talk about first is I want to talk about this other thing that he talks about, which is extremely prevalent in the church today. He says uh, that these ungodly people, they pervert the grace of our God for a license for immorality. And so what is very common in the church today is, and you'll find this in any of the, like, I shouldn't say any, probably 90% of the mega churches, you'll hear a message that, God loves all. He accepts all. He accepts you just as you are. What I'm saying sounds very mainstream. But Jude says it's heresy. Jude says that it's godless people who say this. Jude says that these are condemned people and their condemnation has been written about long ago to say that like it doesn't matter what we do. God just accepts you and he loves you regardless. That, that's not what scripture says. Now, are there passages in scripture that sound that way? Yes, there are. But you can't look at one passage out of the context of the rest of scripture. You can't look at two passages. You can't look at five passages outside of the context of scripture. If I was to Camcord, well, then camcording, oh boy, I just dated myself. So I, if I was to video you on my iPhone or, for a week and to take a five second clip of something that you said on one of the days of the week, I could make you out to be any kind of person I want to because I'm elevating one thing against like a week of everything that you said and did. In the same way, when we take a passage out of context of, of the other passages in that book, not only that book, but other books of the Bible and in the, in the Bible as a whole, that, that you get an inaccurate picture of what scripture is saying. And, and in everything, there's this like law gospel tension because if you only say things like in this direction, inevitably people will take it to the extreme and you get into heresy. And so that's why some people like the Bible contradicts itself. No, it doesn't. It just says, is basically like if you pull in this direction, you also have to pull back in that so that you stay somewhat centered in, into what God's word is really meaning to communicate. And, and, and so there are some passages that will make it kind of sound like it doesn't matter what we do. Let me show you two of them. And they both come from Paul. The first is Romans 8.1. Paul says, therefore... There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, if you look at that passage and you rip it out of Romans, if you rip it out of the rest of scripture, listen, if there's no condemnation and if, for those who are in Christ Jesus, God loves all. He doesn't care what you do. He accepts you just as you are. This is what you'll hear you know, pastors teach, but 
That's not true. And, and honestly, that's not even what that passage says because that passage says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, we know from scripture, that, and we know from James that for those who are in Christ Jesus, they're, 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 they're gonna follow Jesus. They're gonna have good works. Jesus says you're gonna judge a tree by its fruit. So you can't just like do whatever you want and say, I, I'm in Christ Jesus. Because if you're doing whatever you want and not what he tells you to do, guess what? You're not in Christ Jesus. But when you pull that out of context, you get this false understanding. This next one from 1 Corinthians 10, 23. For I have the right to do anything you say, but Paul says, even though you say that, listen, not everything's beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. And so once again, people will be like, well, Paul says, you know, people are saying, and he doesn't seem to disagree. He's just saying, listen, even though you can do anything, it's not beneficial or it's not constructive. Once again, we know that's not true. We know it's not true because of what the rest of scripture says. And, and let me just kind of share with you what Jesus says on the topic, because I, I think we ought to consider what Jesus says. Look at Matthew five seventeen to 19. Jesus said this, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but I've come to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, and uh, like, I don't think that's happened, right? Earth's still here, right? Right? It hasn't happened yet. But until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything has been accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least, even the smallest of these commands and teaches others will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus also says in John 15, 21, for whoever has my commands, not only has them, but keeps them, that's the one who loves me. So we have to have Jesus' commands, we have to keep them. If we have them and we keep them, guess what? We love Jesus. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. So if you have the commands and you don't keep them, guess what? You don't love them. And if you don't love him, you're not loved by the Father. I mean, it's just, it's clear that, that Jesus hasn't told us like, it's all good, that, that none of it matters. It does matter because of what scripture says. James speaks about it once again. Judah's speaking about it, that, this is, that these are condemned people that are giving a license for people to do whatever they want. There's a, there's a theological word for this, and this is something that the church has struggled with, not only in, at Jude's time, which is about 20 years after Christ, but this has been a struggle that has come in and out of the church, uh, honestly, for the last 2,000 years. And the word for it is called antinomianism. Anti meaning against, this is a Greek word, against the law. That there's been Christians across the ages, this is what Jude is battling with, these godless people that say the law doesn't matter, it's all good, you can do whatever you want. And, and, and if you look there on the screen, I wanna educate you a little bit about it and its history. Uh, the doctrine of antinomianism is a belief that the gospel frees the Christian from any required obedience to any law, whether that law is scriptural, whether it's civil, whether it's moral, and that salvation is attained solely through faith and the gift of divine grace. Now, we would say that salvation is solely through faith and the gift of divine grace. It's not by works, but if you're of Christ, you will do the works. In, you know, some more information on its background. This comes from Wikipedia, but it says antinomianism has been considered uh, to teach that believers have a license to sin and that future sins don't require repentance. John Agri Agricola, to whom antinomianism was first attributed, uh, stated, if you sin, be happy because it has no consequence. Examples of antinomians being confronted by religious establishment, because from the time of Jude, religious establishment has said this is wrong. Examples of that is Martin Luther, who did a critique of anti antinomianism. And then there's the antinomian controversy of the 17th century in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. But this is the part that I need you to understand because this is where it's still in the church today. The, church of anti, the charge of antinomianism is leveled most at Reformed, 
churches, Baptist churches, and some non-denominational churches. And so once again, when you think of these large, what people would think is successful churches, they're not gonna talk about sin. They're not gonna talk about repentance. And the message that you're gonna keep hearing is like, God accepts you just as you are. Jude says, no, not at all. And the church over the last 2,000 years had said no, but, but this keeps creeping back in and it's so incredibly common in the church today. Now, the second issue that Jude addresses here is, is those who don't believe Jesus is sovereign. Once again, that word sovereign means all-powerful. Now, once again, the, the, this, you know, the Mormons can be accused of this, uh, Jehovah Witness, but listen, it's in mainstream Christianity. Get this. 52% of Americans, so this is the majority of Americans, 52% of Americans say Jesus was great, but he wasn't God. 52%, the majority of Americans say Jesus was great, amazing, but he's not God. That's the core tenet of what it means to be Christian. And nearly 70% of born-again Christians, and when I say born-again Christians, these are supposed to be the cream of the crop of Christians, 70% uh, of born-again Christians do not believe that Jesus is the only way to be saved. Why? Because pastors don't have the courage to stand up and say, guess what, Jesus is the only way to be saved. Because if we say that, well, because you're... you're uncle doesn't believe, you know, we're going to offend you or your good friend at work doesn't or your kid doesn't. And so we just don't say it. And because of that 70%, almost 70% of evangelical Christians, and that is like the, the, once again, the cream of the crop of Christians, they don't believe this basic tenet of Christianity that Jesus is the only way to be saved. This is what Jude's saying, Jude saying this back in tw 20 years after the time of Christ. Some Godless people who are condemned have snuck in and are teaching you that, that it doesn't matter what you do. And, 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 and they're teaching you that, that, that Jesus isn't sovereign and Lord. Guess what? He is. And we have the same problem in the church today. I'm here to tell you, like, the state of the church is awful today. It's worse than awful. It's pathetic. Now, uh, a member had sent me this clip that I want to share with you. And, and this clip is from uh, someone who I've always respected. Uh, he's a Christian statistician and, and one that uh, has his uh, pulse on the state of the church as long as I've been a pastor. His name's George Barna, and he just does an amazing uh, job uh, getting a pulse for what Christians in America, uh, where they're at spiritually and, 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 and just uh, theologically where they're at in terms of how they view the Bible, how they view God, how they view Jesus and, and, and all these different things. And, uh, and he was uh, recently interviewed and the stuff that he says, like the decline in the church in America uh, has really picked up a lot of steam. And as, as we look at Jude, as we look at these false teachings that are in the, the church, as shocking as some of the stuff is that he says, it really shouldn't surprise us. Let's go ahead and play that. American Evangelical Church in free fall. Recent findings from the Cultural Research Center at Arizona Christian University found a growing decline in Christian beliefs and church attendance. George Barna is director of research at the ACU Center. George, thank you for joining us. So the American church isn't bouncing back the way we'd hoped for after the pandemic. Evangelicals are in trouble. So tell us what's happening and why. Well, the big picture is when we look at some of the measures that often are looked at, like church attendance, we find that that has dropped since the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of people dropped out of church, never returned. If we look at what's happened in the last six years, uh, you know, there's there's been a very significant decline from 56% of adults attending at least once a month down to 35% now. So that's a huge shift. If we look at Bible reading, uh, over the course of the pandemic, you would have thought that would have been a time where more people would have picked up God's word to get guidance, but turned out that was not the case. And so what we've seen is a decline from 37% reading the Bible outside of any kind of church events during the course of a week, 37% down now to about 33%. And 
And even those people who consider themselves to be Christian, regardless of what their belief profile may indicate, if we just look at those who embrace the name of Christianity, that also has continued its skid over the last number of years. We've gone uh, down below the 70% mark now. We're down at 68%. So for a nation that used to have more than nine out of 10 of its adults who at least claim to be Christian, now down to two out of three, uh, that, that's something that we need to pay attention to. And, and what I found most shocking, George, was you're finding that only 55% of evangelicals believe that people are born sinners and can only find salvation in Jesus Christ. Did that shock you? This is a core evangelical Christian belief. Why do you think the church is faltering on that? Well, there are some things that we know that even evangelical churches tend not to talk about very much. Sin is one of those issues. The reality of Satan is another one of those issues. When you start putting together the variety of things that evangelical churches, much less other Christian churches, don't talk about very much, you can begin to see why these patterns emerge. And so you've got that. And then also look at the fact that a third of the people who sit in evangelical churches every week would not probably qualify as born-again Christians. Only God really knows. But the, the research simply tries to estimate where do people stand spiritually. And when we ask people what they think will happen to them after they die, and we find that a third of the people that regularly attend evangelical churches do not believe that after they die they're going to go to heaven and only because they've confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That, too, is a core evangelical perspective, but you've got a large share of the people in those churches that don't buy it. And, and you've been doing this for a long, long time. I, I know you've been doing this for many years. So does any of this surprise you, or do we see the culture starting to creep into the churches rather than the churches influencing the culture? Yeah, honestly, this is a pattern that we started seeing about a quarter of a century ago, and it has simply continued. In evangelical churches, it's been a much slower decline than, say, in mainline churches or other Christian churches. But nevertheless, that decline has continued. And the pandemic was one of those opportunities for it to grow a little bit faster than normally it might have. So I, I think that's what we're seeing here. When we look even at things like people's perspectives on the sanctity of life, uh, we find that among evangelicals, only four out of 10 would say that human life is sacred. And you've only got about half of them saying that abortion for any reason other than to spare the life of the mother or the child is morally unacceptable. So there's rampant biblical confusion or resistance even in evangelical churches across the country. So what are the consequences of, of this then, not only for the church but our society as well, if this decline in core beliefs and church attendance continues? Well, one of the things that we could suggest is that evangelical churches are losing their theological distinctives. As far as the public is concerned, now one Christian church is pretty much the same as any other. And it's hard to find evidence that that's not the case. Culturally, I think the scary part is that when you look to that group of people in our nation who can stand up biblically against many of the unusual, bizarre, immoral changes that are being proposed in public policy, that are being taught in our public schools, that parents are wrestling with as they're trying to figure out how to raise their children. In all of these areas, we're finding fewer and fewer people who embrace biblical perspectives, fewer and fewer people who are capable of defending biblical perspectives in the public square. And so it's, it's one of those situations, I think, where all of us need to sit back and say, wow, am I part of the problem or part of the solution? And if I'm part of the solution, how committed am I to being out there in the marketplace, being that solution on a daily basis? Okay, salt and light. George Barna of ACU's Cultural Research Center. Thank you for taking the time to share those insights. We appreciate it, George. Thank you so much.
So there's a couple different, I and mean, there's a lot of stuff that's really troubling there, but a couple things that, that really jumped out at me is, like he said it, he said like churches don't talk about sin anymore. He said they don't talk about hell. And, and listen, if what Jude is complaining about, like these godless people are, like that Jesus gives us a license to sin, if Jesus accepts you regardless of how you are and, and, and sin isn't a big deal, then you don't have to repent and, and, and it doesn't matter what, you know, what the members do or, you know, how the actor behave. It doesn't matter if the churches, you know, uh, you know, fly LGBTQ flags and, you know, I'm going to show you a video here in a second that will make your jaw drop. None of that stuff matters if you don't believe that sin is real. In, in, that, in that God doesn't give us a license to sin just because we receive salvation in Jesus Christ. And, and it's because that's not talked about anymore because people just want this feel-good message. The statistic that he said is that 55% of evangelicals, once again, the cream of the crop of, of the Christians in terms of Bible-believing Christians, only 55% believe that we're born with sin and that we find salvation in Jesus. That literally means that half of evangelicals don't believe that we're born with sin and that we only find salvation in Jesus. That is like a bare basic tenant of what it means to be Christian. But because we don't have the courage as pastors to talk about sin, because this, this godlessness has come and become a part of the church, uh, this is what the people believe. This is what Jude says, that these ungodly people, these people that are, their condemnation is spoken about, they've perverted the grace of God and given a license for immorality. The other point that I think is worth noting is he says this, and I was shocked that he said this, but I think it's true. He said that people see basically all Christian churches as the same. And he said it's hard to find evidence that they're not. Why? Because if you think of like the majority of Christians, the majority of Christians are going to these huge mega churches that are all not talking about sin. They're all not talking about repentance. It's all about this feel good Christianity that God loves and accepts you kind of just as you are. And, and so, and that's not only in the, the really big churches, but you can find that in the next level and in all the way down. But it's wrong, it's not biblical, and it's heresy. But it shouldn't surprise us because it, the Bible tells us that this is what it's going to become like. This is exactly what it's going to become like in the latter days. Look at Matthew 7, 15. Jesus says this, watch out for false prophets because the false prophets are going to come to you in sheep's clothing. What is Jesus talking about? These false prophets that are inwardly really as ferocious as wolves. What's this sheep, sheep's clothing? Well, the sheep's clothing are the pastors that are wearing their, their, their vestments and their robe and their, their stalls. The, the sheep's clothing are the websites that are going to have the hip pastor, you know, on it, you know, giving these inspiring messages and, and, you know, the pastor, they'll appear to be sheep. They'll appear to be like, uh, you know, uh, true followers of God, but they're actually ferocious wolves. Why? Because as Jude says that, listen, if someone's trying to tell you that it doesn't matter, that because of Jesus Christ, we have this license to sin, that it's all good, they're godless. And you're going to find that in probably the majority of Christian churches today, this, this false teaching, this heresy that Jude refuted 20 years after the time of Jesus. Look at 2 Timothy 4.3. It says this, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers who will say what they want to hear. So we're in that time, there's this perfect storm. And the perfect storm is like there's these false teachers that appear to be like sheep, but they're as ferocious as wolves. And you combine that with, we're also in a time in which people aren't going to put up with sound doctrine. They're going to they're gonna surround themselves with, with people that will tell them what they want to hear. So think about like all those, not all, but a vast majority of these really successful mega churches, we all look at them like, wow, they must really have the spirit of God. Look at how they're growing. This is that. No, scripture says that in the latter times, it's, it's that people are going to only go to those things in those places where people tell them what they want to hear. And in the end, we're in those days. We're in those days in which the church no longer influences culture, but culture influences the church. 
a week and a half ago, I did a podcast on um, th- this, uh, this story that honestly, at least a half a dozen of you have sent me, like, did you hear this? Did you hear this? Did you hear this? This is from a liberal Lutheran church, the ELCA. They're the most liberal branch of Luther- Lutheranism in America. This pastor, she's a woman pastor, and uh, she is saying this creed called the Sparkle Creed, which she didn't come up with, someone else come up with, but her congregation is saying it, and apparently they say it often because they seem to know it well. And even at, in, in that creed, you're gonna hear that, you know, uh, she, she re-describes God and re-describes everything about who he is. Um, and, and at the end of it, uh, it's going to go to one of our prayers, and, and the prayer is as offensive as the creed, and the prayer is uh, basically uh, the lyrics of a Taylor Swift song. The Sparkle Creed. I believe in the non-binary God whose pronouns are plural. I believe in Jesus Christ, their child, who wore a fabulous tunic and had two dads and saw everyone as a sibling child of God. I believe in the rainbow spirit who shatters our image of one white light and refracts it into a rainbow of gorgeous diversity. I believe in the church of everyday saints as numerous, creative, and resilient as patches on the ace quilt whose feet are grounded in mud and whose eyes gaze at the stars in wonder. I believe in the calling to each of us that love is love is love. So beloved, let us love. I believe, glorious God, help my unbelief. Amen. For Taylor Swift and her Swifty fans and all music that inspires us, help us shake it off when life takes a turn, Remind us that we can still make the whole place shimmer. And when the time comes, help us confess and say, it's me, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. God of love. I mean, it's horrific. In fact, I, I think, like, if you listen, like, you hear people giggling during the prayer. And what's crazy is, like, this isn't a small congregation. I, the congregation seeing that Sparkle Creed, it's not like there's just five people saying it. Like, you, you have lots and lots of people saying it together. And how do you get there? Well, you get there, like, if God accepts all, if, if there's really not sin and no, con- listen, if there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, what's wrong with it? Well, nothing. But there is condemnation because that's not in Christ Jesus. But it's because the church has dropped talking about sin in that to be like a true follower of Christ means to be obedient to him, that like to each his own. Listen, when I, when I read Jude to you, was he saying to each his own? Jude would like, he'd have an aneurysm if he saw that. He would stroke out. Jude says that people who've like said nothing matters, like you, you can do whatever you want. He said, these are godless people, condemned. And we're like, eh, what's a big deal? And what bothers me going back to the Barna comment is like, people see all churches as basically the same. So they see that, they just assume like all churches are that way. And maybe you don't go to that extreme, but, but maybe you go to like, you know, all churches really don't really talk about sin and God loves all and accepts all. And they expect that that's a message that they're going to hear from, from any church that they go to. They, they think that that is the standard Christian message, even though it's literally heresy. In I mean, I can tell you, like, I think people kind of expect that here. I, I've had, over the last several weeks, like, I, I've had people literally come up to me, and it's, it's been this way, for, actually, for a long time. Like, I, the, this isn't something I've heard once or twice, but they're like, you know, you won't believe how many churches I've gone to trying to find a church that, that will talk about sin, that will talk about repentance, that will speak about truth. This is literally my 10th church, my 12th church that I've went to. And, and, and like, so I know people are like, we're, we're not known for the, for the fact that we do that. We're, we're different than what many of the others are, but, but they don't realize that. 
I also know it because probably about every three weeks or so, maybe every two weeks, maybe every four weeks, but someone will get up in the middle of my sermon and walk out. Why? Because they don't like hearing about sin. They don't like hearing about repentance. And they don't like hearing about there's only one way to be saved. And so they get up and they walk out. Like they, they, they just assumed we'd be like the rest of those churches that are like, you know what? God loves all and he accepts all. It's all good. It's not a big deal. And, and you know what? It, in the church today, like there's two different kinds of churches. There, there, there's churches that are offering like lake, muddy lake water. And there are those that are offering spring water. But you know what's funny? Is people would rather drink the muddy water. That's what everyone's going for these days. John 4.14 says this, but whoever drinks the water that I will give them, they will never thirst. But the water that I will give them, uh, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. So the truth of Jesus and his word, it's spring water, it gives you life, but, but people would rather drink the dirty lake water that ultimately is gonna make you sick and die. And a church isn't a church. I have to be honest with you, like I used to, I don't care where people go. I, I would always say, you know what, listen, I don't care if you go here, just go somewhere. But when we understand the extent that false teaching has come into the church in our day and age, it's a big deal where you go. Because there's a lot of places that you're thinking you're drinking, you know, spring water, but you're actually drinking lake water that's going to make you sick and ultimately kill you. Because it's not the truth of God's word. You know, that, that's, that's why we got to be doing better. Like, why does someone have to go to 12 different churches? Like, why isn't it that like, oh, you're looking for a church that speaks the truth. You ought to try light of the world. They'll tell you like it is. And that's all of our responsibility that, that we're not known for that. I try, I mean, I put stuff out on the sign that, that really kind of expresses that, but that's where all of us is, is, is you know, parts of, of this church and not just this church, but other churches that, 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 that speak truth as well. We gotta get that word out. You gotta get that word out in social media. You gotta get that out in your friend group. You, you know, you gotta get that out in conversations at work. We can't just assume that wherever people go nowadays is fine because it's not because Jesus says that there's going to be these wolves in sheep clothing and that, that there's going to be all of these false teachers. And you know what's crazy is in preparing for this message, I went back and, and looked at like the heresies that the church has refuted over the last 2,000 years and you wouldn't believe like most of them are very prevalent in the church today. These are heresies that like people were put to death for teaching these things, right? It was a big deal. And now we're like, eh, to each his own. In fact, like I, I've already got my plan for what I'm teaching for this upcoming Wednesday class that I teach for, for the first part of the fall. But I think for the second part of the fall, I'm really gonna teach a class like heresies across the last 2000 years and how prevalent they are still in the church today because they're just accepted. As I was preaching on this and kind of looking through that list, I wanted to mention a heresy that's very prevalent today. It's not one that Jude's speaking about, but it's one that I think all of us need to hear because it's so prevalent today. And I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes on it. But I wanna to talk to you for a second about uh, a heresy called Montanism, okay? And it, it's a movement that emphasizes the importance of prophecy. Prophecy is so important in, in, in especially the charismatic church nowadays. It's an importance of prophecy and ecstatic experiences. Now, Montanism, known by its adherence as new prophecy, was an early Christian movement of the late second century. And it was later referred to by its founder, Montanus. And Montanism held views about the basic tenets of the Christian theology that were similar to the wider Christian church. But in addition to their basic teachings that were compatible with the Christian church. It's labeled a heresy and was labeled a heresy 1800 years ago for its belief in the new prophetic revelations. The prophetic movement called for a reliance on the spontaneity of the Holy Spirit and a more conservative personal ethic. Parallels have been drawn between Montanism and what? The modern day Pentecostalism including Oneness Pentecostal 
in the charismatic movement. This new revelation movement is so common in the church today that, that, that everyone's waiting on a word for the Lord. And, and I'll get people that'll come up like, uh, the, the Lord's give me a word for you. And, 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 and people are thinking they're getting a word from the Lord just about every day. They're expecting this personal revelation. Well, I mean, this was ruled a heresy 1,800 years ago. And I'm here to tell you, like, one of the largest churches in this country that is located right here in the Metroplex emphasizes this and is this type of church. But it's heretical. It was called heretical 1,800 years ago. But guess what? No one cares. To each his own. It's not my flavor of ice cream, but it's fine for someone else. No, you can't look at it that way. Listen, I don't deny that God can't still reveal himself in a very personal way. I I would say I've experienced in my life, but I say all the time, listen, God's not chatty. And it's not just me that says it, like the church said it as a whole 1,800 years ago, calling it a heresy. Why? Because God speaks to us through his word. We don't need a new revelation. I mean, if he, if he needs to talk to you about something, he can, but it's not real frequent in scripture and it's not gonna be real frequent in your life. He, he gives us his word. And, and that's what we need to look for, to, you know, on how to live and in, 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 in for the revelation of God. We're in the last days. And we've gotta be careful because Satan is prowling around like a lion seeking to devour someone, seeking to destroy people's faith. And it's serious. And that's why Jude's like, these are godless people who who are condemned. It's not eh to each his own. And just because a pastor teaches something doesn't mean it's true. Just because a church has a building doesn't mean it's like, it's, it's truthful or it's accurate. There's a ton of false teachers out there and there's a ton of uh, of false teachings floating around Christianity today. Go back and look at the heresies of the last 2,000 years. You'll see a ton of it in the church today. Make sure that your beliefs are rooted in the teachings of God's word and not in the heresies of some false teacher that is really a wolf in sheep's clothing. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious Almighty God, we thank you for this this look in the beginning of of our look into Jude and Jude's warning to us of of the false teachings that have crept into the church and merciful God, what an amazing amount of false teachings have crept into the church today, including just believing that we have a license to sin, that none of it matters and that half the church, church doesn't even see Jesus as sovereign and Lord. It's It's beyond embarrassing. I just pray, gracious God, that there'd be a revival in the church. I pray, gracious God, that you give us as a church and as individuals courage to not only speak the truth, but but to be known for that. And to be that light that leads people to you rather than that false light that ultimately leads people to their own damnation. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.